qui suis bas. Amen. Welcome, 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 everybody. Uh, we just want to say thank you for those that are, are obviously, that, that are here in the house and for, for those that are online watching as well. Uh, we don't want to forget to mention uh, that as well. We welcome everybody. We're so grateful to God. Amen. Uh, hey, there's only like, what, seven more shopping days, right? How many of you are ready? I see like three hands. Okay, I'm not, I'm not in, I'm in good company. I did my first shopping last night, so I feel like I'm ahead of the game this year. <laughs> uh, uh, we, we, again, we want to welcome everybody here. Thank you for, for worshiping with us. Uh, for those that, are, that are, are visiting with us, we would like to ask you if you wouldn't mind to look around you somewhere in the seat around you. There should be a, what we call a connect card. We'd love to have you fill that out and turn it in at the desk upstairs. As you weigh out, we give you a small gift. But we also just want to follow up with an email to say thank you for being here worshiping with us. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you few announcements to bring to your attention is, first of all, uh, Christmas Eve service. I know we've been talking about it for a while. We'll probably, if we don't have it, we'll go here in a second. Uh, the slide that is, is uh, um, we're going to be joining with Awakening Church, uh, Pastors Barry and Heather Cawthon, again, kind of one of our sister churches here in town. And so we're looking forward to that. We're going to have, it's going to be a truly combined service. We're going to have some of our worship team mixed with theirs, some of our greeters mixed with theirs. Uh, I'll have an opportunity to share for just a few minutes. Uh, the children are kind of, kind of, kind of commingled together as well. So uh, we really, I really want to encourage you. Please come out next sun, next Saturday night. Um, it's going to be a fairly short service, less than an hour. So you'll be out of there by six o'clock. You can get home and get back to your cooking and wrapping and and all of that sort of stuff. And then we will not have service the following day on the 25th to allow you time to that that entire day to spend with your family and so forth. And then we'll be back together the next weekend. So keep that in mind. Um, and I think probably the only other true announcement is we've decided on the 28th, which is a Wednesday night, to have a prayer and worship night. A very low-key, informal time together. And uh, we're not going to uh, do like a midnight sort of thing, but we're going to meet at 6.30, and we're going to call it till about 7.30. We'll see how things go. If we need to go longer, we'll go longer. But we're going to say from 6.30 to 7.30. And just a time to come together and, and just put on some, some worship music. We're not going to uh, uh, have, have a full church service per se, but just a time to seek God as a family. We want to minister with each, to each other and, and just love on each other for a little bit that night. A um, couple of other things that we need to do here before we uh, close out is, uh, Margie, I'll just have you do your thing next if you would. Most of you know the Klaus Myers have such a heart for overseas ministry and missionary work and so forth. And uh, we try to, to allow space and time for them to come and to lead us in a prayer for various people's groups throughout the world. And so that's what we're going to do right now. All right. Good morning. Glory to God. We get to pray for the Nepalese today. Uh, you know, I just posted a, a thing on our thewaitingworld.blog. We put short stories and sayings about missions on there. And it said, if you take missions out of the Bible, all you have left are the covers. And it's so integral to the Christian faith and the spread of the gospel. And I'll tell you what, in uh, Nepal, um, it's very, it, they just had an election and no uh, party won enough. So the, the country is in even more chaos than it's already been. There's a lot of persecution going on in Nepal and for that reason, some of the Nepalese believers have come over here, and we actually have a church going here in the Springs and one up in Denver that are actively growing. So, um, but I want to tell you a little bit about it. Uh, very, very few people uh, in Nepal are Nepalese. And while the leader of the country said, oh, it's okay to be a Christian, uh, there's still, there's communism is persecuting the Christians, the, the other sects of the Hindus going on persecuting Christians. Uh, one of our friends reports that they finally planted a little church up in the hill country away from Kathmandu, and uh, they're seeing miracle healings, absolute miracle healings going on in there. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, during COVID, they lost 52 pastors to COVID. I mean, it really impacted the country. And so they have been doing Zoom services, which is very, very expensive in Nepal, but still um, they continue to conduct those services sort of underground. Um, they're seeing hundreds of healings with a very few churches over there. And one interesting thing, one way to we reach out as missionaries is through something called business as missions. You go into a country and you don't say, hey, I'm a Christian. Um, you, you start a business, could be a travel business or anything, because there's a lot of American tourists go over there. And um, yeah, they, are, they hire non-Christians and then they work on them. It's really good. So anyway, okay, uh, let's pray. Uh, we want to pray against the spirit of fear and superstition that keep the Nepalese from coming to Jesus. Father, there is so much persecution. We can't even imagine the amount of persecution in that country and what it's like. Please, Father, we pray that you will raise up more pastors and leaders yeah. to disciple the new converts that are coming to you. Give them more dreams and visions of you in the night. We know that happens, God, and we want you to do it. Please pray that the Nepalese will become a Christian stronghold, sending missionaries to surrounding countries. Lord, we pray all this in Jesus' name, and we ask your hand of protection on the existing ministries over there. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Yeah, amen, amen, praise God, amen. It's so good to kind of expand our horizons a little bit, so I appreciate Klaus Meyer's heart, such, such a heart for overseas work and so forth. Uh, the next thing we want to do before we kind of get into the word is we want to take just a couple of minutes, and we want to uh, recognize and, and, and pray for Kristen Mayberry as she's getting ready to leave us and head off to, so come on up, Kristen. Carol, come up to me for this too, please. Uh, she's getting ready to head off to for some unknown reason, Minnesota, to go to school th this coming semester. And uh, come on up, Kristen. And Kristen, like many others, does not like the spotlight. We know that. She doesn't, she doesn't like to, to have the attention on her. But uh, Kristen is kind of a behind-the-scenes person helping us out a lot with the tech and so forth. And, uh, you know, some of you may know she went out California way for school for a little while last year. When she come back, she's been going to school here, and now she's moving up to uh, the northern tier up in Minnesota. So we just want to pray for Kristen, and I'm going to ask Carol to lead this. this I just time wanted to tell us a little bit about what you do and what you hope yeah. um, Okay, so uh, Carol wanted me to say that. <laughs> um, so... Um, Last year in California, I was um, diving out at school as well. I was majoring in mechanical engineering, and um, I was diving D1, and then um, I've been continuing um, diving this semester here, um, and then I got my associates in general studies, um, and next semester, I'll continue diving in Minnesota and keep working on my bachelor's for mechanical engineering. So she's smart, talented, and an amazing athlete, so... Anyway, Father God, we just thank you for Kristen. We thank you for the blessing that she is to Amen. Spring's Journey, Lord. God, we're going we're gonna to miss her, Lord, as she travels back to school. And, Lord God, we pray that as she enters into this new campus, Father God, that you have her people waiting for her. Yes. God, that her students, those people, Lord God, that she's supposed to connect with, will be right there waiting, Lord God, and they will know each other when they see each other, Lord God. I thank you, Father God, for the tribe that you have for her in this new location. God, we thank you for her wisdom in knowing, Lord God, what to do, what not to do, where to go, where not to go, Lord God. We pray, Father God, that you would just give her a divine understanding, Lord God, of all things that she needs to know in this new location. Father, we pray for her dorm. God, we pray for her roommate. Father God, we pray for every person and everything, Lord God, that she's to come in contact with, Lord. And God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit being with her, leading her and guiding her into all truth and into every area and every place, Lord God, that she's supposed to be. Father God, we ask for favor with her instructors, favor with her professors, favor with staff, Lord God, and all the things, Lord God, that she needs to accomplish in that place, Lord God, that your hand of favor is upon her. Thank you for opening doors for her, Lord God, to do the thing that she needs to do. Father God, thank you for enhancing, Lord God, her studies, Lord God, and giving her, Lord God, wisdom and direction and knowledge in all the things, Lord God, that she 
will be studying, Lord God, and needs to put her hands to work, Father. We just thank you for this young lady, Lord. We pray your blessing on her in every area, Lord God, that we may not even mention that you know that she needs, Father God. And we pray for mom and daddy yeah. as she heads off, Lord God, to another state and to, to school, Lord God, and that you would minister to their hearts, Lord God, and just help them, Lord God, in, in her absence, Lord God, to, to just be able to just cheer her on, Lord God, and to lift her up in prayer, Lord God, whenever she comes to their mind, Lord God, that they would just offer her up to you all over again. And we thank you for that, God. Amen. 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 You want to say anything else? No, I know you don't. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Christy. Hey, one of the things that I just thought about in relationship to the, uh, the Christmas Eve service next weekend is uh, please make sure you go to the right Awakening Church. Okay. There are a couple of them in town, and uh, so we don't want you to end up wondering where, where everybody else is. And so, uh, again, the address is, was up there. It's also in your handout, but it's Awakening Church on Oro Blanco. Okay, that, that's, that's important to know. Uh, there, there are a couple of churches in town with that in their name. Uh, wow, so excited to continue slash wrap up this, the series that we've been doing uh, for actually today is week number six. And so it's kind of, a, kind of a long period. You know, most series don't typically go that long, but... Uh, it's been a blessing to me. I hope it's been a blessing to you. And like I said, we're going to continue the, the part of it where, where we're hearing testimonies from, from various people in the church and, and kind of getting to know each other a little bit better and what it is that, that God has, has done for them. Um, as we get ready to start, let's go ahead and, and uh, we're gonna, I'm going to ask you to stand again as we read a passage out of Isaiah. And I'm going to get turned to that. It's Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 should be on, on the screen here in a second as well. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And verse 7 isn't on the screen, but I want to continue reading. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Heavenly Fathers, we are in your house again today. We, we set aside this time to say, God, we are yours. The truth is we are yours day in and day out. But Lord, in this focused time, we just join our hearts and our spirits together, Lord, to just come and, and to say thank you, Father, so much for what has been given to us and made available to us, Father God. So we thank you. We ask that you enlighten us, instruct us, correct us, do whatever you choose to do. Challenge us through your word and through this time here today, we pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, as we get closer to Christmas, I, I was listening to a message the other day, and the, the preacher said something that really, really stood out to me and struck me. He said, you know, people get really excited about the gifts that are under the tree. He said, honestly, I'm more excited about the gift that was on the tree. And I like that. The gift that was on the tree. Notice, was on the tree. We know he, that wasn't the end of Jesus' story. But as we have been, been in this, this Tell the Story series, I just want to kind of remind you, I'm not going to kind of go back and reteach re or preach these, but we started out with week one talking about the importance of story. The importance of sharing what God has done for us. The importance and the impact that our testimony can have on somebody else. And that somebody else's testimony has had on us at some point in time. How important that is. Then the next week we talked about 12 spies but two stories. And how the children of Israel came to the, to the border of Canaan. And, and God sent, told Moses to send 12, uh, to, uh, um, Joshua to send 12 spies into Canaan to check it out. Ten of them came back with a very negative reply. Two of them came back and said, we can do this. And how God began to, to work that story out. The third week we talked about memorials. And you remember how when the people of Israel crossed the Jericho and God told them to go back and to take 12 stones out of the Jericho and to bring them out and to set them up as a memorial. And I brought a few, you know, things that were important to me and, and asked you to kind of, you know, begin to think about things in your life that are important to you that remind you of the goodness of God and the things that he's done. The next week we, sp we, we spoke about community. And community and, and in story, how do those things tie together? Well, we focused on there is the fact that your story ties to your story, ties to my story. And when we do that, we, we enhance and we build up this sense of community among ourselves as sons and daughters of God. And then last week, we talked about uh, having an expected end. 
and how it's so important to realize that not only is our story what has already happened, but it's what God is going to do. Because the things that he's going to do next week and next month and next year eventually become a part of your story overall. And so those are some of the things that, that we talked about leading up to today. And it was really kind of cool to me because I thought, you know, what better way to, to end this, this series than here the last Sunday we're going to be gathering before Christmas to get together. And the message today is entitled, The Greatest Story Ever Told. Because you see, my story is important. It's important to me. It's important to my family. Your story is important. Your story is encouraging. But the truth is that none of us even has a story without the greatest story ever told. It doesn't matter what I can do on my own. It doesn't matter the accolades I can gather. It doesn't matter the degrees I can get. It doesn't matter how rich I become. None of that matters if it's not tied in to the greatest story ever told, which is that of Jesus Christ. So that's what we're looking at today, and I'm going to kind of ask your indulgence a little bit, because today might be a little bit different. It's, uh, you know, I tend to be more of a, a teacher preacher than anything else, but today maybe even a little bit more so. And so what we're going to do is look at some of the key players in the Christmas story. And then toward the end of the message, we're going to hear from another one of our, our, our blessed people here in the church. I'm not going to tell you who it is just yet. I'll kind of leave you wondering. But the first scripture that we're going to look at is going to come from Luke. What I thought was kind of, kind of cool, interesting, neat, however you want to say it, is that as I got into this, the four, there could be more, but the four uh, people or, or people groups that I felt like we were supposed to, to kind of focus on today is there's a different passage of scripture of the Christmas stories throughout the Gospels that speak to each one of them, kind, kind of specifically. And I thought it was, it was interesting how that kind of worked out. And so the first one we're going to look at is Mary. Appropriate that the song that, that Carol and, and Benny and, and Catherine did for us a few minutes ago is Mary, Did You Know? Um, she kind of knew, but I don't know that she fully knew. It's kind of like us. We kind of know sometimes what God is doing, but we don't fully know until he begins to reveal and to, to show those things to us. But let's look at Luke chapter 1, and we're going to start with verse 26. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, and I'm going to start right there in case somebody doesn't know the tie between Elizabeth and Mary. Elizabeth was Mary's cousin, a much older cousin, because it, as we read and you'll see in other scriptures later on, it says that she had been barren for her entire life. She had been trying to get pregnant throughout her life, and she had been unable to. But God touched her, blessed her. She was now, uh, was now pregnant, and uh, she's actually not just pregnant, but she was carrying what we, who we now know as John the Baptist. Uh, and so John the Baptist and Jesus were cousins, which is kind of cool. Um, but as we continue reading, the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, the town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. He was a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary, asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. What a promise that is. What a promise that is. No word from God will ever fail. I hadn't even focused on that when I was preparing, but man, that just struck me today. No word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. The first thing I thought about when I started thinking about Mary was that how some religions really tend to, to exalt Mary. But because of that, I think that some others look at it and maybe devalue her a little bit. That's a mistake. That's a mistake. Mary deserves to be honored. She deserves to be reverenced. She's not to be worshipped. She's not to be put on the same level or above Jesus as the Son of God. But man, what a testimony she has. What a story she has. She's probably got a greater story than anybody else I can think of other than Jesus himself. What a story she has. 
And so as we're working our way through this and we look at this, I thought, I thought, man, what a person she must have been to have been the one selected. What kind of resume do you have to have to be picked to become the mother of Jesus, the Son of God? Come on, what, what kind of resume does that require? But verse 28, is, here is Gabriel says, Greetings, you were highly favored of God, the Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled, yeah, well, I would think so. And it wondered what she meant. And it's almost like Gabriel, if I can kind of paraphrase or, or put this in modern-day lingo a little bit, it's kind of like Gabriel said to her, came to her and said, hey, Mary, can we talk? And how many of you know that any time your spouse comes to you or somebody important comes to you and says, we need to talk, you immediately kind of, what did I do? What did I not do? What's coming next? And that's what Mary said. It says she was greatly troubled, wondering what kind of greeting is this? What's, what's next? And so as we're going through this, I kind of want you to put yourself in this person's place just a little bit. How would you have responded to this? You know, how would we have reacted? And so then Gabriel comes to her, and she asks a, a very uh, pointed and, 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 and honest question. She's like, how's this supposed to happen? And we don't really know how old Mary was, depending on, you know, what studying you read or what you look at. You know, she's between maybe 12 to 17 years old, very young. Somewhere in that range is kind of where most, most scholars land. Um, just for the sake of, you know, our conversation, let's say she was 16. It's somewhere kind of in the middle of that. So here this angel comes to her, and, and as a 16-year-old, she knew what it requires to have a son. Okay? And she tells this angel, um, I ain't never done that. How is this going to be? And so the angel says, the Holy Spirit of God is going to come upon you. Uh, let me read that part again. Uh, verse 35, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And then drop down to verse 38 again. He says, she said, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. And that just blew my mind when I read this time because Gabriel tells her how this is going to happen. And all of a sudden she says, oh, cool. Then let it be. What, what kind of heart did this girl have to take God at this word that the Holy Spirit was going to come upon her it caused her to conceive a child, and she was going to give birth to somebody called the Son of God. And then she just says there at the end, well, okay, your word be fulfilled. And it says, then the angel left her. And I hadn't necessarily planned to, to go into to this, but, but Carol mentioned it earlier back in the back during prayer this morning, and then again from the stage. As if you remember from day one of this past January, the theme that I had been bringing and talking about is what? Expectancy. You've heard it over and over again from me. And so here Mary is, and she hears this word, and she's, she has such a heart for God and such an openness to this that she allows this expectancy to begin to be generated in her and to, to really kind of overtake her entire life and her entire being at this point where she is expecting God to do what he said he's going to do. And again, that's such a challenge to us. Now, if we jump over to verse 46 in the same passage of Scripture, what happens in between is that Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, I encourage you to read that, but we've got a lot today, so I'm going to just jump down a little bit. But now Mary's had a couple of days to kind of think about it, and hear, hear what she said. Verse 46, and Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Holy is his name. Thinking about Mary, even today, but even more so, obviously, in that day, I have no doubt that she knew some of the challenges that were to come with being pregnant now but not being married. She, she no doubt knew that she was going to be ridiculed. She no doubt knew that she was going to have people be suspicious of her. I mean, come on, what's she supposed to say? The Holy Spirit made me pregnant? The Spirit of God is causing me to have a baby? Yeah, got it. What ridicule she must have been, been, been knowing was going to be happening. And then, you know, even beyond that, just the pressure of raising the Son of God. The pressure of, of, of being the mother of the Son of God. As you keep going through scriptures, which we'll do in a minute, you'll see how her involvement uh, was obviously she was in the birth. But then as Jesus was about 12 years old, how her and Joseph lost Jesus at the temple in Jerusalem. And then she shows up in Cana at the, turning of the, uh, the miracle turning the water into wine. And obviously she was at the crucifixion. We're, we're told that quite plainly. Uh, so we see her throughout the story. 
And so as we talk about, about Mary, I just want to say it's important, I think, that we give honor to whom honor is due, as the Word of God says, right? She deserves to be honored and respected and reverenced for her story, but not worship. So then there's Joseph. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on Joseph, but we're going to look at Matthew chapter 1 as we read just a little bit about him. I think Joseph just deserves some, some, uh, some respect and some, some platitudes also. Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18. He says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her from the Holy, is from the Holy Spirit. And she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us, God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So again, we don't know a whole lot about Joseph. We know that he was a, a descendant. He came from the lineage of King David. If you kind of read uh, earlier in, in chapter 1, you'll, you'll see that. We know that they lived in Nazareth. Uh, we know that he was pledged to marry, uh, marry, um, to marry Mary. We know that he's referred to as a carpenter later throughout the scriptures. So that, that, tends to, that, that seems to be, have been his occupation. And most, most writers believe that he died somewhere before Jesus reached the age of, we'll say, 33, which is about when Jesus was crucified. And the reason for that is the last reference you find to Joseph in the scripture is when he was about 12 years old at the temple in Jerusalem. And so from 12 to 33 in Jesus' life, there's no mention of Joseph. And at the crucifixion, when Jesus was about to die, if you remember, he looked out and he said, uh, his mother was there and, so, and, and his follower, uh, his disciple John was there. And he said, woman, behold your son, and son, behold your mother. So he, he was tasking John with the, the responsibility of seeing that Mary was taken care of and was okay. And that would have been Joseph's role had Joseph still been around. So most people believe that, and, and as do I, that he had died somewhere along the way. But again, I just want to kind of want to say, imagine the pressure. It was enough that Mary was, had pressure, would have experienced pressure raising the Son of God. But how would you like to be Jesus' stepfather? In a sense, that's what Joseph was. Because not only was he his, what we'll call stepfather, but his real dad was still in the picture. Every single day of his life. And I wonder, man, what would, what would it have been like as a, as a dad, an earthly dad, to try to raise a boy that you knew was the son of God? How do you discipline him? How do you get on him for not picking up his toys? How do you get on him for, and we don't know what Jesus was like as a child, but we know he was fully human as much as divine. So, and we know that he grew in grace and wisdom, the word tells us. So, you know, we look at that and I wonder, what would it have been like? What kind of pressure would there have been on me to raise the son of God knowing his real dad is still in the picture. It would have been, been a lot. And so we read absolutely nothing about neg negative about Joseph in the scripture. He seems to have been a man of God who really wanted to do, the, do right and do the best and seek God's heart. So that's a little bit about Mary and Joseph. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the next two groups of people. The, the next one being what we call the Magi or the wise men. So Matthew, we're in Matthew now, I believe. So we're going to stay here and gonna go, to, uh, go to chapter 2. Starting in verse 1, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. And they asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was, was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out, they were from, and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. 
As soon as you find him, report to me that I too may go and worship him. Yeah, right. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now this is interesting when you get into what we call the wise men or or the magi, as the NIV refers to it here. And uh, when you hear magi, you kind of start thinking magician sort of thing. But that's not what it was. The magi, it meant that they were were like stargazers. They They were astronomers, if you will. They were philosophical, kind of very intellectual sort of thing. It was a, a, a demographic of, of the population. Uh, but it reminds me of a story that I heard a long time ago. I just wanted to share it with you guys. That, you know, there was, a, there was a businessman from up north, one of the northern states, that for whatever reason his business had taken him to the south. And so he's driving through Georgia or Alabama or one of the southern states. And as he was driving along through this town, this small town, came to this intersection and looked over to the right-hand side, and there was a nativity scene set up. Not unusual, right? But this particular nativity scene was very intriguing, confusing, and it really got him to wondering what this was all about. And the reason being that the wise men were dressed as firemen. They had the long coats on, they had the fireman hat, even had a fire truck back behind them. So there's the traditional Mary, the traditional Joseph, the, the, the shepherd, uh, but the wise men were these firemen. And so the guy's totally confused by this. So he goes into the gas station across the street and asks this older man at, at the counter, he says, hey, I got a question for you. He says, you're, you're a nativity scene out here. He said, it's cool. He says, but it, it's very confusing to me. Well, the old man at the counter looked at him. He said, what's confusing about it? He said, well, it, it, it doesn't line up with the Bible. The guy said, excuse me? He says, we're very careful to be very scriptural and stay right with the good book around here. And the guy said, well, then what is this all about? He said, why are they dressed like firemen? He says, it's right there in the book. It says, the wise men came from afar. I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. All right. If you got it, you're going to get it. If you ain't got it by now, you're probably not going to. But when we talk about the wise men, there's lots of different discussion, interpretation, uh, opinions, whatever you want to call it, about who they were and, and so forth. And I just, in, both in this and then also when we talk about the shepherds, I want to present to you some alternative things to consider. Now, when I say alternative, don't get scared. I'm not going against the Bible. I'm going to give you a scripture for everything that I say. But I think it's going to maybe challenge you to think a little bit differently. I know it has me, especially when we get to the shepherds. But talking about the wise men here, you know, traditional thinking is that there were three wise men, and that's what we see at every nativity scene and so forth, when really we don't know how many wise men there were. Scripture doesn't say there were three. Now, Scripture does say there were three gifts. It talks about gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So we've just kind of made that, that natural assumption that there were three gifts, there were three people giving the gifts. But we really don't know. Some of the reading and, and analysis says that hey, there might have been 12, there might have been 25, Nobody really knows, but we do know that these magi, these philosophers, these astronomers, these astrologers had come from afar (laughs) and were there to worship Jesus. Now, many believe that they were actually from uh, from Persia, which is where modern-day Iran is. And that makes sense, and I'll I'll explain why in a second. Um, Now, Persia was roughly 1,000 miles from Bethlehem. Uh, depends on what part of Persia, obviously. It's talking about the first part of the border or middle or, or the other side or whatever. But somewhere between 800 to 1,000 miles. So these, these, these magi had traveled roughly 1,000 miles. And they didn't jump on an Amtrak. They didn't take a flight. They were either on foot or donkeys or camels or whatever it may have been. So that was a dedicated effort. There was, there was something... Deeply, innate, deeply inside of them that made them want to do this, that, that drove them to undertake this journey to come see Jesus. And also, the traditional nativity scenes, they, they, they show the wise men right there, you know, at the birth, or, or immediately after the birth of Jesus with Mary, you know, holding the little baby and all that sort of thing. But the truth is that Jesus may have been as old as two years old when the wise men or the magi came to visit. 
And that, again, is because I'll show you a couple of scriptures that kind of, kind of lend credence to that. Is, again, consider the, the journey that they had to, to go through. But if you look at verse 11, which we just read, it says, On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, and they bowed down and worshipped him. I'm sorry. On coming to the, what? House. I thought Jesus wasn't born in a house. That's the first thing to let us know that this may have been a different setting than what we've traditionally come to accept or expect. And then the fact that when, when Herod, we, we didn't go and read it, but if you went down to verse 16, you find that Herod kind of got played a little bit because he told the Magi, hey, go and find out where this king of the Jews is because he was concerned about his own standing, his own stature as king. He didn't want anybody to grow up and take his place. And so he was concerned about that. He told the Magi, go and find him and then come back so I can go worship him too. It was not his intent at all. But then God told them through an angel, he said, don't go back the same way you came. Don't go back to Herod. So Herod got played a little bit here. And so when he got angry, and it says that he had all the baby boys that were two years old and younger killed because he wanted to try and take Jesus out. Now, if this had all been happening at the same time, is there any need to go up to two years to wipe out all the baby boys? So that's why some believe that it may have been, he may have been as much as two years old when, when this particular part of this story actually happened. And I believe that the reason that they were so driven to be a part of this, so driven to come and recognize and, and, and uh, uh, worship Jesus, is because if you remember, many, many years before, the Israelites had been taken captive and taken to Babylon, the majority of them. Now, Babylon is where? It's in Iraq today. So Iraq, Iran, and they share a border. So if you will, it's the same general area of, 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 of the world, really. And so during this time, that's when Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and, and many, many others were, were there as captives in, in the land of Babylon, close to the land of Persia. And there were multiple prophecies given about the Son of God, the, Son, the Messiah that was to come and so forth, all of these things. And so these magi, these, these wise men, they would have known these stories. They would have known these prophecies. There would have been something that had been passed on and had become a part of their story, if you will, because over the years... All of these things they had heard and all these prophecies that being given were now uh, a part of, of what was happening in, in the area they were from. And somehow or another, they, they got word, whether they were just driven to follow this star or, or they got a word from an angel, we're not really told, but they made this trek, they made this journey. So they knew these. And they got there and they said, where is this one that has been born, the king of the Jews? And I find it interesting because they didn't, there's no doubt in, in, in what they said. They said, where is this one who has been born the king of the Jews? It's like they had, they had grasped this. They were, they were confident in this as well. They were, they were convinced of it. And that, so they searched for him. And, and I don't know, if I were them, I might have just kind of played it cool for a while and, and allow enough time for this, this baby that was born to grow up and see if he really began to, to take that rightful place as king of the Jews. And then maybe come and recognize him. But no, they were so convinced that even as a newborn babe, they made this, this journey. This newborn babe to two years old again. So who were they? We don't really know a whole lot about them other than what we've just covered, but we do know these, know these things. They believe God's word. They believe the prophecies about the Messiah. We know that they sought him out to the extent of traveling a great distance. We know that they worshiped him. And these expensive, these gifts they gave, they, they weren't dollar store kind of stuff. Okay? They weren't from Walmart. These were expensive gifts. Gold, a symbol of divinity. Frankincense was used in burnt offerings. Myrrh was a spice used in embalming. Think about those three things. The gold for divinity, the frankincense, a burnt offering or a sacrifice, and then the myrrh used in embalming. Even in these things, there was foreshadowing happening, and God was, was, was painting a picture and developing a story. And they were even willing to double-cross the king in order to protect him. And so these really were some wise men. I want to read this passage of scripture to you out of Isaiah. And just kind of look for the nuances uh, that might speak to these men and to their coming to, to worship Jesus. Isaiah 60, verse 1. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the people. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your, your what? Your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons 
come from afar, and your daughters are carried on the hip. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. To you, the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephah. And all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. Isn't that cool? This is Isaiah. Many, 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 many years before what we just read happened. Now, the shepherds. This one, this one may be the one that has kind of excited me the most. And so why would you say the shepherds excite you the most? Okay, not, not, not super exciting in and of themselves. But if you haven't picked up on it, I kind of like digging into the things and looking at, at the thing behind the thing, if you will. And so that's kind of, this grabbed my interest here today, uh, or this, uh, as I was preparing for this. I want to turn to Luke chapter, one, uh, chapter 2. eventually. Luke chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, and to, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to marry, be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths. Now, this is, I'll be honest, this is another area where I think there's a key thing that's left out of the NIV. If you go back to the King James Version, some of the original words, you'll see that. Because what does it say that he was wrapped in? swaddling cloths. And why is that such a big deal? I'll show you here in a little bit. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah of the Lord. And this will be a sign to you, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest of heaven, in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying God and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So, when we talk about the shepherds, again, our westernized, traditional understanding, uh, when, when, when we think about it, is, is that the shepherds are, are these the, the little kids in long bathrobes with towels tied around their head, right? That's pretty much, how many of you were a shepherd when, and when you were a little? You see, th that's what we think of a lot of times. But I just wish, and we can to an extent if we want to be diligent about it, but I wish we could read Scripture in light of Jewish tradition and history and understanding. Like I said, we can do some research on that, and, 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 I, and I hope you will. But why did this angel, why did God choose to reveal who Jesus was and what was happening to this group of shepherds. These guys were commoners, if you will, out watching these stinking sheep. And this is the traditional account. And so a couple of thoughts for you, and I'm not saying these are wrong. I think there's truth in these. But first of all, it could have been a foreshadowing of the relationship that Jesus was going to have with his people. Because all throughout Scripture, Jesus is referred to as our good shepherd. Psalm says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And there's, there's all of these, and it, and it paints a, uh, such a, a beautiful picture, really, of God, the relationship that Jesus wants to have for us and, and with us. 
But I think because of that, we've kind of romanticized this, uh, this, this understanding and concept of what a shepherd was. Because if you'll do some looking and some digging into the word or into the, uh, the Jewish history and so forth, you'll find that in the majority of the cases, shepherding was not a very well-respected occupation. And in fact, it was very much the opposite of that. In fact, I came across one article that spoke to it, and it was talking about how that shepherds were, uh, in most cases, not allowed to testify in court because their word was considered undependable and unreliable. Um, so why would God choose to deliver this life-changing news to this group of people? Again, I think it's part of, of, of a foreshadowing of the relationship he's going to have because we are often ca called his, his sheep. Jesus says in the book of John, that my sheep know my voice, and a stranger they won't follow. So there's this relationship there. So could this have been a part of it? I think it's certainly plausible. I think the other part of this is that by revealing this news to what was, has been understood to be common people, commoners, if you will, uh, there, there's this illustration that Jesus is here for all of us. He's not just here for the elite. He's not just here for the wealthy. He's not just here for the, you know, the, those that, that, that are high in government and so forth. He's here for all of us. He came for the commoner as well as those that aren't so common, I guess you could say. He came for each and every one of us. And man, that, that is so important. So I don't want to devalue that because I believe it's absolutely true that he did come for each and every one of us. And then there's, when, we, when we come to Christ or before we come to Christ, that moment of understanding that Jesus cares about me, that is so enlightening and so life-changing. Because enough, some of us don't get that as we're, we're growing up and so forth. Like you, don't, you don't get that, that sense of value and, and, and your importance and that you matter, but you matter to Jesus. But I recently came across another interpretation. This is one I want to share with you today. So I want to just ask you to, to, again, indulge me just a little bit as we look into the scripture on this. Now, in the Old Testament, we know that sacrifices were extremely common. They, they were a part of everyday life of individuals. They were a part of, of temple life in, in Jerusalem and in, in other places as well. Uh, and there were lots of feasts that required sacrifice. And in fact, there was a daily burnt offering sacrifice, a morning and an evening sacrifice that took, took place. And then once a year, then, uh, you know, there was a, the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. And so it was sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. And that required a lot of animals. I mean, you can see that, right? Well, about three miles, and some say, some say five, so somewhere between three to five miles south of Jerusalem is where Bethlehem is located. And so this is where Bethlehem is, but on the edge of Bethlehem was, is an area, and you can, you can look this, this stuff up and study for yourself, an area called the Shepherd's Field. The Shepherd's Field. But it was very uncommon for shepherds' fields to be located that close to town because shepherding itself was not a very well-respected occupation. In fact, I want to share, uh, you, you may know, we talked about this a, a while back, is uh, in, in the Jewish tradition and culture, you had the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, and then you had what's called the Mishnah. The Mishnah being a collection of rabbinical writings over the years that, that really kind of added to what was laid out in the Torah. And it described what was acceptable or not acceptable within, within their life and their culture. Well, in the Mishnah, there's something called Baba Kama 7 7. It's almost like, say, John 3 16. Okay, it's a reference. And it expressly forbids the keeping of flocks throughout the land of Israel, except in the wilderness. The only flocks otherwise kept would be those for the temple services. Hmm. So, where am I going with this? So, Jerusalem. It's where the temple, Solomon's temple, and, and, and the subsequent temples were built were in Jerusalem. Just three miles south of Jerusalem is where Bethlehem was located. There in Bethlehem is something called the, the shepherd's field, which is where the sheep were being raised specifically for use in sacrifices at the temple three miles up the road. This is the only, only, the only ones that were, that were, were accepted within the, the, the populated area. And the, the shepherds actually were trained in the Levitical law. So they're referred to as Levitical shepherds or priestly shepherds. And their job was to raise sheep that were specifically intended for use in all these recurring sacrifices. And these shepherds were different. They weren't the common everyday shepherds, but they were trained in temple practices. Uh, they meticulously cared for these sheep. The law required these sheep be without blemish, without brokenness, in order to be acceptable to be used in these sacrifices. So while common shepherds were often forced to keep their flocks out away from the city, these priestly shepherds were allowed to be 
closer to Bethlehem, which was close to Jerusalem. And it says in verse 8 there that the shepherds were living in the fields. If you notice, it says nearby, keeping watch over their flocks. So, please stay with me with this. I know it's, <laughs> maybe it's just the nerd in me that likes this, but I hope we've got some nerds out there also. So we got Jerusalem, we got Bethlehem. There on Bethlehem, you have the shepherd's field. There also in the shepherd's field is something, it's a watchtower called Migdal Eder. Anybody ever heard of it or studied it out? Migdal Eder, M-I-G-D-A-L, and then E-D-E-R. So much earlier, this was a tower, a watchtower, and much earlier than the time of Christ, this tower was most likely used as a military outpost. Because if you got Jerusalem and you're looking to protect Jerusalem, you're probably going to want to put a watchtower or a guard somewhere outside of Jerusalem to pick up on the fact that there's an enemy headed your way. And so this tower was set up there and, uh, in, in, in Bethlehem. And it is actually believed that, and I'll show you here in Scripture here in just a second, that this is also the place where Rachel, Jacob's wife, died and was buried. So let me show you that. Let's go to Genesis chapter 35. Genesis 35. And we go to verse 14. Now we know that, before I start reading, we know that Jacob, God later changed Jacob's name to what? To Israel. He then became the father of the 12, had 12 sons who became the, the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. So this is who we're talking about right here. Verse 14, Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place where God had talked to him. And he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. And Jacob called the place where God had talked with him Bethel. And then they moved on from Bethel while they were still some distance from Ephrath. Now, Ephrath was the ancient name of Bethlehem. So if you hear Ephrath, it also means Bethlehem. You'll see that here in a second as well. So while they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, Don't despair, you have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Benoni, which is son of my sorrow, but his father named him Benjamin, son of my right hand. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar. And to this day, that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. And then Israel moved on and pitched his tent beyond Migdal Eder. So you put all those kind of pieces together and so forth. It's understood that this area is, is where Rachel had, had been buried and, and this pillar was established. Now, whether the tower was built exactly over the pillar that he, he put up, we, we don't really know that. But it's interesting to me because Migdal Eder is interpreted tower of the flock. Let there be light. <laughs> it didn't work. So, maybe we can just hit the, the light switch over there on the wall or something. So Migdal Eight are interpreted as Tower of the Flock. Thank you. So let's look at Micah 5 and 2. I'm trying to bring all this kind of stuff together here for you. Micah 5, 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrath, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. And then also in Micah 4 and 8, as for you, watchtower of the flock, stronghold of daughter Zion, the former dominion will be restored to you. Kingship will come to daughter Jerusalem. Now, why do you need a tower of the flock to watch over these animals? Because there were prey that would sneak in at night. There were, there were robbers that could come along and so forth. And so they, they use this tower to provide uh, some oversight. And it's interesting because if you look at Luke 2 and 8, what does it say? It says there were shepherds living in the fields nearby keeping watch over their flock from the watchtower. Another thing that's interesting about Migdal Eder is the birthing of the lambs. The birthing of the lambs. And in, in, in the lower portion of the tower, there would have been the, these areas where when the, the mama lambs were about to have their babies, they would take them in and they would give birth in these areas, in these stalls. It's actually a word called fatne. They would give birth in these stalls or these cribs. And that's where these sacrificial lambs would be born, was in the lower part of the tower of the flock. And so as they were born, because the law was so clear that only perfect, unblemished, undamaged lambs could be used to be sacrificed at the temple, 
Because it was so clear, the shepherds, when the mamas would give birth to the lambs, they would take these swaddling cloths and they would wrap them to protect them. Hmm. Do you see a commonality? To protect them. And then if you look at Luke 2 and 7, we won't go back there and read it necessarily right now. Well, yeah, we'll try to on my page. I might as well read it. She wrapped him in, let me go to verse 5. He went there to register with Mary, who was placed to be married to him and expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in swaddling cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So here this is, the sacrificial lamb of God. And there is this actual discussion about, is this where Jesus was born? You know, we know the story about no room at the inn and all that sort of thing. And then there's discussion about maybe it was a cave or, or maybe it was a, a back portion of someone's home and all of this sort of thing. And I, I, I honestly don't know which of those stories is 100% correct. I'm here to offer you some food for thought. And as I see these scriptures, there's so much foreshadowing that God does in the Old Testament leading into the New. There's so much to the intricacies of God's plan coming about. There's so much to the greatest story ever told that I believe this could be. There's some discussion that this could be where Jesus was born. And over the years, around the 4th century, there was a monastery built, and it's believed to have been built over where the tower used to stand. And I'm not going to try and tell you all the details played out exactly like I've, I've laid out here today, but what I will tell you is that Jesus came for you and I. Jesus was the spotless Lamb of God. Jesus was born. Jesus did die. Jesus did raise again. And he is the greatest story ever told. And you and I don't have a story without his story. John 1 and 14, I'm going to share two more scriptures with you, and I'm going to close. John 1 and 14 says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen the glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Praise God. I am so thankful for the story of Jesus that allows me to have a story and to bless, to, to walk in this blessed life that I have, and the same for each one of you. So as I offer that to you, you know, I hope you'll go back and study. I really do. I um, hope you'll look at it. And if you do, you're honestly going to find competing opinions. And you're going to say, this group's saying this group's crazy. This group's saying that group's crazy. And, and, and all this back and forth. Um, but the word talks about letting every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. But it's important that we dig into the scriptures. So I hope there's something that kind of grabbed your attention there today and, and, and will cause you to, to dig a little deeper. Um, we're going to keep in line with what we've been doing at this point in time about tell the story by having um, Susan come up here in just a second. And she's going to tell a bit about her story. Uh, we've had about six or seven different uh, individuals or, or, or couples come up so forth. And, and I hope it's been blessing you. Uh, I know it's been blessing me. So come on up, sis. I'm just talking to you. Get up here. Yeah, let's give her a hand. Come on up. <laughs> Haven't heard her yet. <laughs> Hi, I'm Susan. Well done. Well done. Um, on November 29th, 1975, I got both saved and delivered from alcoholism. And here is the, um, the memorial stone that Jeff talked about several weeks ago. It's my AA sobriety chip. It says 47 in those very annoying Roman numerals. Am I right? Yep, that's what it says. And I always try to have my chip with me. But I usually leave it in my pants and then it gets washed in the, in the, in the washer. So it's clean. So, so that should be the end of my story, right? Wrong. It's just the beginning. So buckle up, we're gonna go for a wild ride. You ready? So um, that night in November, um, 47 years ago, two people came to my door and they were young, like me then. I was we were in our 20s. And they um, were from a new church plant here in town, in the south end of town. And they knocked on my door to tell me about Jesus. And it was just the right time because Earlier that year, I had been to the doctor because my alcoholism 
was so toxic, the alcohol was so toxic to me that even though I'd only been drinking for seven or eight years since I was like 15, um, I had some very severe physical symptoms, but I kept drinking. And if I had continued to drink without the Lord's intervention, I wouldn't have lived very long. So I'm not a, I, I don't, I'm not a very good drinker. <laughs> so, but I tried really hard, and it almost killed me. And so um, they told me about the Lord, and I got saved. And we set up a plan to have them pick me up at church that the next Sunday. Um, and so uh, that night, I poured out all my alcohol, flushed all my drugs down the toilet. I do not recommend that, by the way. It's not a good thing to do. So, <laughs> so please don't do what I did. I was young and stupid and not thinking straight. So, um, but I was, the miracle was that I was spared detox. I didn't, you know, that was the miracle that I could walk away. You know, and I've, I've gone to meetings in, in, de in detox centers. It's not pretty. It's horrible. So, um, but even though I was free from the, the craving of alcohol, I still had an alcoholic mind and an alcoholic body that was healing. Because we drink because we have pain. Even as a 15 year old, there were things in me, I'm a crier, it's too late now. <laughs> so I'm already, I'm already got the microphone, you're not taking it away. Um, and so, um, and all those things had to be healed. Um, I, I had the, you know, the, the craving was gone, but I was still left with me. And I drank all those years to avoid dealing with those things. And so I went to this new little church. Everybody there was, almost everybody there, they were in their 20s, like me. They were young and zealous and had almost zero wisdom. And it got worse. So they welcomed me into the church, and I said, um, well, you know, I have a drinking problem. I should probably go to AA. And they said, oh, no, sister. You don't need AA. That's of the devil. You got Jesus. It's you and Jesus now, which was true. But I was still very, very messed up and not, and not healed and not nearly ready to be an adult. Because even in those eight years when I drank, I did a lot of risky, dangerous, foolish things. And I had to heal from all that, too. And so... Um, because I was so messed up, I took them all with that word and said, okay, it's me and Jesus. So I got a Bible, and I read it, and I prayed, and I studied it. I went to every time the door was open in that, that little church, I showed up. Every woman's meeting, every other thing they did for 20 years, I showed up, and I did it. And the Lord started healing me. It wasn't fast, but it worked. So now, 20 years later, here I am. And me and my family are sitting in the church that we've been in all these years. And it's a, a Sunday morning in 1995. And something was about to happen. But before I tell you about that, I have to go back and tell you a few other things. Um, we, I, I have two daughters. We have two daughters, two magnificent, magnificent daughters. I'm so proud of them, and we're so close. But at that time, they, when they were, um, they were in the Christian school in the church, school that I helped to start. And I didn't realize that they were being mistreated in that school. It took years to figure that out. That's how messed up I, I was. To my, to, my, um, to my shame, I had to, I had to you know, ask my daughter's forgiveness for putting them in that situation all those years. So when we finally realized, we took our daughters out, our hearts were broken, we apologized, and then we homeschooled um, the, the, next, the last few years until they graduated. And not too long after that happened, there was some major um, misbehavior in the leadership of the church. Stuff pretty sick and twisted, and I'm not going to dignify it by, just by talking about it. Um, when those things happened, I thought, I need a new church. 
But my husband was determined to, to help this church right itself. Not too long after that, my husband, who was by then, had been a, a deacon in the church for many, many years. Um, and as far as I was concerned, he was one of the few righteous leaders left in this church. But the elders decided they were going to take his ministry away. And they did. And it crushed him. And that was so hard to see. But he still wanted to give this church another chance. And I was, I was done. So that day, um, in 1995, that Sunday, we sat in the church, and the church split. <laughs> and I wasn't surprised. But I turned to my husband and I said, you can go to one of these two splits, but I'm not. And he said, me neither. <laughs> and we got our girls, our wonderful girls, and we, we left. Um, my husband and both of my girls told me that, um, that they were never going to go to church again, period. And after what we'd all been through, I didn't blame them. But see, I had this 20-year history of me and Jesus, and that wasn't going to work for me, for me personally. So I decided, and this had to be a God thing, that I was going to go find a healthy church and stay there with or without my family. But I had no idea what a healthy, healthy church looked like. I didn't know what healthy leadership in a church looked like. So I found a big church that looked okay from the outside, and I went in and sat in the balcony for months and licked my wounds. I didn't interact with anybody. Um, I just watched. And I listened. When I started feeling a little more comfortable, I decided to do something. So I applied for and was hired to be a nursery worker in that church. So I worked nursery. And I thought, well, this is a great way to get to know the people in the church without having to interact with the leadership. <laughs> so, so. And as I got healthier, I started doing what I did in the old sick church that worked for me. I went to everything I could go to. I got involved in women's ministry. Um, I went to every um, event. Every time the church was open, I was going to be there. Pretty soon, I was asked to join the women's leadership in women's ministry, and I did. And then, and then by accident, I got involved in youth ministry there. We had, it was a big church, so we had a middle school ministry with its own pastor and a high school ministry with its own pastor. And, and there I was. And those two young men, I worked alongside them. Um, I got to respect them and appreciate them. And I felt safe with them. I trusted them. One today is uh, running a church in Monument right now. And so um, then I thought, hey, what if I go to AA? Maybe I won't go right to hell if I walk in the doors of AA. <laughs> so that's what I did. I found a meeting. I sat down. And then um, uh, I started crying. I cried for months. This was the thing. Hi, Susan. Wait for it. Wait for it. And I cried. Because I finally landed on my home planet. I finally found my people. People like me that struggled with alcoholism. I could finally recover out loud with other people. It was still me and Jesus, but you know, now we had a group. So I, I got a sponsor. I started going to all kinds of meetings. I went to, I uh, started working the steps. Um, and they were actually from the Bible, if you, if you know anything about the 12 steps. And, um, and I even went to Al-Anon. Because Al-Anon's a good place to learn how to grow up. It's a good place to learn how to not enable others in their nonsense. It's a good place to learn how to take care of yourself. And so, there I am. I'm healing even faster. And then, I have a lot of and thens. And then, I go, you know, it, I find out that my healthy church 
now has a um, faith-based 12-step ministry. It's not part of the church. It's one of the pastors that was going to church there st was started a ministry, and he asked the church if he could use one of their building, one of their rooms, and they said yes. So I started going there, as well as with the other things in the church. But then that that little ministry got its own building, and so I went with them. So I had church and a meeting in the same at the same time, the same place, and I continued to grow and heal. And then <laughs> the pastor of that, of that ministry was offered a job in, um, in Indiana with a, a well-established men's recovery ministry. This has been in 2019. It's been a long journey. <laughs> so, and so they left. And I was alone again. But I was getting good at it. Me and Jesus, we've had, we had many years under our belt. And so... Um, I started looking for another church. And I did my, my usual thing. I go in, sit in the back, didn't interrupt with anybody. I watched, I listened, trying to figure out which one was going to be my new church. And then we had a pandemic. So everything went online, you know, after that. I was Zooming here and Zooming there to my meetings and to churches. Um, I started reading um, some, some very good, strong Christian authors. And I listened to a whole lot of true crime podcasts. It's been a long pandemic. You know? <laughs> so, so that was the other thing I did. And so um, here we are. Um, I did that until someone invited me here. And I said, okay, I'll try it. I did my thing, sat in the back, didn't interact with anybody. Some of y'all have noticed this already. I watched and I listened. And I kept coming back. And finally, I did something that I hadn't done for years. I invited my husband to come to church. And he said, okay. Finally, 27 years, I married a stubborn man. <laughs> and so now here we are. Um, but that's, uh, there's one more thing I need to tell you. And other than I'm hungry and I want to get out here and go eat. <laughs> so, um, so let me wrap this up in a nice big old bow. Um, if you take anything away from what I just said, it's not a story about a good church and a bad church. It's a story about me looking back over 47 years. Now, I can look around and see some of these faces, and some of you have as many years, if not more, than me under your belts. So you know what it's like to look back. And what do you see? You see the hand of God. <laughs> and that's what I saw. So even though there were times when I was lonely and I felt alone, that it was just me and Jesus, it was never just me and Jesus. And that, that's my story. <laughs> Praise God. Who knew that Jesus went to AA? <laughs> uh, we are so glad that you and Alan are here. And we just want to pray for you guys just real quick if we could. Father, we thank you, Lord. God, I thank you for the story that Alan and Susan have. Thank you for the faithfulness that you have demonstrated, God. Lord, if there's anything that life teaches us is that man will let us down. But, Lord, you never do. You never do, Jesus. So thank you that you're weaving yourself into their story in every way possible, Lord God, and that you have kept them, you've protected them, and you're continuing to draw them closer and closer to you, Lord God. So we thank you, and we speak nothing but your blessing over them, Father God, right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sis. Amen. So last thing we're going to do is the worship team is going to come back up and, and, and lead us in, in, in one more worship song. So you guys get involved in this. I think you're going to recognize it. I guess I should talk since they're not ready yet. Amen. Uh, again, next Saturday night, Awakening Church on Oro Blanco. All right? Hope to see everybody there. It's going to be a real blessing. Uh, again, you'll be out by, by 6 o'clock. You can get back to your, your cooking and your Christmas wrapping and, and everything else. You can finish getting my presents ready and, and all that. So. <laughs>
His grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace Father, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Father, we do praise you today, Lord God. We thank you again for the sacrifice, for the love. I know it's Christmas, but Jesus, uh, but I think of the scripture that says that you endured the suffering and the shame of the cross for the joy that was set before you. And we were that joy. So thank you so much for what's been given to us and made available to us. And Father, now I pray over each person that's here, each family represented, those watching online. God, and we just ask that you just lead and guide us as we come into this this special week right now, Father God, as we uh, just continue to, to give you glory and honor and praise. And we love you. We thank you for this time together in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you.